Welcome to tonight's Fireside Chat uh, with Lynn with Lynn and LaRouche for Thursday, July 28th. As some of you are aware, uh, we have indeed struck uh, gold, if you want to call it that, or blood, or perhaps something different. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, which had two weeks ago actually put out a list, which some people have now referred to as a blacklist, of journalists that were, in their view, enemies of the state. The first 31 journalists, or rather persons really, listed were all people who had participated in, spoken at, in other words, uh, usually, uh, Schiller Institute conferences. Other persons were included besides those people, like Glenn Greenwald or John Mearsheimer, uh, or others, uh, but the, uh, the the all of the first thirty first first thirty one slots were filled by our people, with uh, Helga being number two. Now, uh, this has now begun to cause or elicit all sorts of press reactions from all over the world. Some of that we will uh, recount, uh, but we don't want to start out that way at the moment. Uh, just because there's, there's a bit of detail, it's useful, and it'll be useful to tell you all about it. But let's just say that uh, some uh, bloggers like uh, Jimmy Dore or others who have million-person followings are shocked that they're not on the list, and they don't really know how the list got generated. As a matter of fact, several of the people who are on the list, have, like Scott Ritter, for example, uh, state in, res- in responses that they have made to the statement that they don't exactly know what the premise is or what the Ukrainian government agency, the so-called Ukrainian Center for Combating Disinformation, what they were thinking or why they did it or what the rhyme or reason was. They can't tell because nobody, there's no statement that tells people that the reason for the attack was the Schiller Institute. That is to say, from the standpoint of those persons running, manipulating, operating, deploying, that entity called the Ukrainian government, apparently they considered to be uh, the most, at least, uh, concerning uh, personages uh, to be those that were associated with the Schiller Institute. One could say, oh, well, now that's just accidental. Um, That didn't really happen that way. Well, but then here's here's an interesting question. Uh, would, would, uh, would even the most incompetent person working at the Ukrainian Disinformation Service not know that Glenn Greenwald was better known than uh, Caleb Malpin, for example, who was on our list? I mean, that, 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 that just doesn't make any sense uh, that, you know, if you, if you look at it. You say, well, they simply cut and pasted a list. Yeah, but would you, be, would you, would you do that if what you were trying to do is in the middle of a war? indicate the primary problem that you considered, uh, you know, primary, the people that you consider to be your primary problem in winning the hearts and minds of people. So there was, there was no accident in this. Uh, it is a blunder, uh, but it's not an accident. And so there's, there are many things that one could add to this. There's a statement which I'll read uh, in a, in a, after Mike Billington gives his presentation, which is, is, been, is, is in circulation. You won't see it in tomorrow's briefing, uh, but we will indicate its contents. And, and the reason is that we're in the, in the process of getting back to all those people that participated in the conference, uh, and we are discussing with them, putting out a, a joint statement. We have a draft uh, of something, um, and that's underway as we speak. Okay, so with that having been said, there's more that can be added and there's more that you'll be hearing. Uh, uh, but let me go right now to Mike Billington, uh, both for his own view of this process I've just uh, referenced, but more importantly, the actual background and context, an evolving context, international context, that surrounds even this event uh, as catalytic and as important as it may be. So. Mike, you have the floor. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. I'll add one thing on the on the uh, uh, the release itself from the Ukrainian 
uh, Security and Defense Institute, which is that every coverage of this, and it's been covered widely everywhere, all over the world, the New York Times, Newsweek Magazine, Tucker Carlson, and so forth, despite the fact that the top 30 people in this list are people who spoke at the Schiller Institute conference, Helga Zeppler-Ruch is right at the top uh, as the key person who's considered the main enemy of this Ukrainian, uh, it's not really Ukrainian, this British-American plan for war on Russia, which is what it is. None of them mention Helga Zeppler-Ruch or the Schiller Institute. It's not they're not the important people, you see. It's uh, Tulsi Gabbard and Greenwald and then Scott Ritter. They're mentioned. Uh, in the Newsweek case, they actually name each of the people who spoke at the Schiller Institute conference on the list, except Helga. Uh, but they don't mention that they spoke at the Schiller Institute conference. They're just saying they're on the list. Well, why is this? There's, there's terror in the institution about the name Lyndon H. LaRouche. It's been spawned over the last 50 years by the total cooperation between British intelligence and American intelligence and the American media. Do not mention the name LaRouche. If you do, you're gonna get the LaRouche treatment. And many people who have moved to, uh, to support our work in Europe and, and the US and around the world get calls from the State Department saying you better cut it out or, or that's it. And, and people tend to give in to this kind of thing. But this is, this is a terrible blunder, not only for the war itself. We can trace this back to the 2014 coup run by Victoria Newland and, and uh, John Kerry and the Obama administration against the elected government in Ukraine, the placing of Nazis in power in order to prepare for a war on Russia. We can trace this back and blow it up. And even more than that, we can trace this back 50 years to the containment of Lyndon LaRouche and his ideas, uh, that this gives us the ammunition to blow this up if we do this right. And all of you are called upon to work with us to make sure that this becomes a, 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 uh, a, a, a ledge that we have, a, a, a knife into the guts of this disgusting operation to prevent people from knowing the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche over these years. That now that the whole, every, everything LaRouche warned about for years and years and years, the threat of global war, nuclear war, the threat of a hyperinflationary collapse of the economy because of the insane policies being implemented, all of that is now in front of everybody's eyes. And they're looking around for who told us the truth and who has solutions. And this is the moment that they're panicked that people will indeed properly turn to the LaRouche organization, the Schiller Institute, uh, for those solutions. So we'll come back to this. But what I, what I want to do first is I want to sort of look around the world over these last couple of weeks and look at the way the world is looking at this, uh, this division between the U.S. and the British on the one side and Russia and China on the other and think about how the world is looking at this, the vast, vast majority of the world, the vast majority of nations, the vast majority of the population, how they're looking at this. Uh, so let's start with Asia. Uh, in Indonesia, Mark Milley, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, went to Indonesia this week. And remember, this is the same Mark Milley that, uh, that Colonel Richard Black, you may recall, in a, in a broadcast he did on, on the Schiller Institute and the LaRouche Organization website. He said Mark Milley was participating in an attempted coup against the President of the United States, President Donald Trump. Uh, he made clear that he was breaching every code of conduct, the military code of conduct. So this is the same Mark Milley, who's still the head of the Joint Chiefs under, uh, under uh, Joe Biden, uh, and he went to Indonesia, and he went with the, met with the president, uh, uh, Jokowi, Joko Widodo, president of Indonesia. And he said, oh, I'm here to protect you from the vile danger that you face from China. China is aggressive. They're threatening you. Uh, I'm warning you, be careful. China is threatening you. And then he met with the military chiefs in Indonesia, and he said, we are here to help you 
against the aggression and the threat from the Chinese. We'll help you with this. Well, that's, that's fine and good. The next morning, the president, Joko Widodo, got on an airplane and flew to Beijing, where he was given a state visit, the first actually foreign, foreign leader to, uh, to visit China since the February um, uh, Olympics. In, in Beijing. I mistakenly thought that the BRICS conference that took place there uh, at the end of June was live. It actually was virtual. So this is the first foreign minister to actually, for, foreign head of state to actually visit. And he was treated royally. He and Xi Jinping and other leaders in China discussed the incredible uh, cooperation between Indonesia and China. Many, Chinese, many Indonesian leaders have told me over the years that the infrastructure projects throughout Indonesia, and there are many, Indonesia is actually booming. And he, they say every one of these infrastructure projects has Chinese characters on the sign outside. The most famous being the high-speed rail, which is nearly completed now, between Jakarta and Bandung, the second major city. Bandung, you, most of you have heard of probably. It was the site of the famous 1955 Bandung Conference. Uh, where, where Sukarno and Zhou Enlai and Nehru uh, had the meeting of what they called the Asia and Africa leaders. This was the first meeting of the former colonies of Asia and Africa coming together without their lords from the West, meeting on their own, uh, and uh, in that process declared what eventually became known as the non-aligned movement. Uh, which, in fact, is an inspiration for what's taking place now, where the vast majority of the developing sector, the global south, is saying we don't want to be allied with one side or the other. Don't tell us to choose. We can be your friend, but we're going to work with Russia and China because they're offering development. So this, this is uh, Indonesia's cooperation with China. Now, what's going on also in Asia? I'm sure you've all heard. Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi. Uh, is planning to go to Taiwan. She was going to go earlier, and then she got COVID, so that was canceled. But now she's, no date announced, but she's planning to go to Taiwan. Now, what does this mean? The, you know, the key to U.S.-China relations was the agreement when we uh, recognized China as, as one nation, what they call one China, is that China, the mainland China and Taiwan are governed by different political systems, but they're one China. Taiwan is a province of China. Uh, and th there is a sovereignty that we respect for China, which includes Taiwan. So here's Nancy Pelosi. Now, despite, in, in addition to all the evil things that everybody knows about this character, Nancy Pelosi, it's important to remember she's number three in line to the presidency. We have a president who everybody now knows is suffering from very severe senility, cognitive uh, damage. Uh, even his own networks, CNN and MSNBC, the networks that ran the Russiagate hoax and then brought, brought uh, Biden into power, even these stations are now regularly running spots identifying uh, Biden stumbling over his words, losing track of where he was in the middle of a sentence, shaking hands with ghosts, and so forth. They're very, very worried about the fact that this guy cannot be our president. He can't, he's not capable. In fact, there was a poll released today that says 75% of Democrats don't want him to run for president. And you can understand why. Uh, and then, but then the question is, what was... What would happen if he were to be removed by one means or another? It would be Kamala Harris, a total airhead, who has absolutely no capacity to be president of the United States. And if they managed to remove her one way or another, you know who would be president? Nancy Pelosi. God forbid. So here's the Chinese watching her planning to come to Taiwan, obviously with the support of the Biden, of the Biden administration, and she couldn't come without it, they assume. Uh, and they have been very clear that this would be a military threat because it would be a declaration, uh, as, as one of the news hour reporters tonight said, that the nation of Taiwan, which is it's not a nation, province of China, but she said the nation of Taiwan, 
and and uh, Dan Blumenthal, leading spokesman for the uh, the American Enterprise Institute, a neocon operation. He he was on Newshour the other night too, and he said, "Of course, Nancy Pelosi has to go. If she doesn't go now, she's capitulating to Chinese aggression. She's showing that we are cannot stand up to the evil of the Chinese Empire trying to take away the world from us, and so forth." So, but it's clear that this is a very real threat to Chinese sovereignty. They've already declared by various spokesmen, not the government officially, uh, but that were she to go ahead and, and plan this trip, perhaps they would have their jets accompany the plane that brings her into Taiwan or maybe have a flyover of Taiwan, which they haven't done yet, uh, which then Mark Milley, the same Mark Milley I just mentioned, who was in Indonesia, he was asked about this. He said, well, if Nancy Pelosi plans to go to Taiwan, we will assure her security. So are you going to have U.S. Air Force jets accompanying her plane, meeting up with uh, Chinese jets? You can see what's happening. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of thing that can lead into a war. Now, what, what's the plan here? Look at the way in which they started this proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. This began way back in 2008 when NATO first voted to allow, uh, eventually allow Ukraine to join NATO. <clears throat> I won't go through the details, but that's really when it began. And then 2014, when the U.S., Victoria Nuland bragged about the $5 billion she spent to build anti-Russia uh, regime change, color revolution organizations, and we financed the violent revolution against the elected government by neo-Nazi forces, uh, and then from that point forward refused to negotiate with Russia for any security guarantees in this anti uh, sort of reverse Cuba missile crisis situation. In other words, we force Russia to take action militarily to stop something they could not tolerate, the destruction of the Russian citizens in the, in the, uh, uh, the east of, Don uh, of Ukraine and the Donbass, and the threat of putting these weapons on their border. They'd seen this once before with the Nazi forces under Hitler, and, and they know the consequences. So <clears throat> this was forced. Why? So that we could run this surrogate war militarily in Ukraine but more importantly, run immediately full-scale economic warfare, uh, which they thought was going to isolate Russia. Now, we know that that failed. Russia and China and the vast majority of the rest of the world are working together uh, to counter this evil coming out of the Anglo-American NATO crowd. Uh, but this was their plan, right? Their plan was to destroy Russia since the, they know that there's no way you can save this bankrupt Western financial system uh, within the system itself. They can raise interest rates, lower interest rates. They can do this. They can do that. They know that the years and years and years of printing money for bailing out the banks and sustaining the military and letting the real economy collapse, it's now beyond repair. It can't be fixed. So instead of putting these banks through bankruptcy reorganization, implementing LaRouche's plan, their policy is, okay, we'll destroy the opposition. We'll destroy Russia and we'll destroy China. Well, it's not going to work, but this is the game plan which could lead them to something which could spark a thermonuclear war. And that's, that's the, uh, the ultimate danger that we're looking forward to here. They're playing uh, in, in China and in Ukraine they're playing Russian roulette. And the one bullet in the cartridge is a nuclear weapon. So this is the danger that we're facing. The lunatics could lead us into that kind of a nuclear war if we don't change the way they think or change them. And of course, the Western leaders are falling like flies. Uh, Boris Johnson, Draghi in Italy, uh, Macron, he's still in power, but his party lost in the parliamentary elections. Biden's Ford is down to 30-something percent, uh, about, I think it's the worst ever for a president. I mean, this is a situation where the West is in complete disintegration uh, and only adopting LaRouche's policy can possibly save them from their own self-destruction. 
And this is, again, this is why as dangerous as this, this is, as, as uh, dangerous a moment in history it is, it's also the greatest moment of opportunity, precisely because everybody recognized things are going to hell, that the shock after shock after shock is hitting. Today they finally admitted that, they, <laughs> that we were in a recession and the administration is trying to change the definition of recession and saying, no, not really. But, you know, everybody knows how this situation is deteriorating. And therefore, they're ready to rethink and look back to who's been lying and who's been telling the truth. And the LaRouche movement has been telling the truth for 50 years, even though it made us very unpopular in the popular media. It got us all uh, subjected to DOJ prosecution and prison time and so forth. But we stuck to the truth. And therefore, people have a basis to trust us. Now, let me move on to another part of the world, which is the Middle East. Many of you know that Biden, I used to probably watch Biden's Middle East trip a couple of weeks ago. He went to Israel. He went to Bethlehem. He met with uh, the head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas. He then went to Saudi Arabia. He met with Mohammed bin Salman, and he met with many of the individual leaders of the other Gulf states. He went there with, with several intentions. All failed. He went there with the idea that the U.S. and Israel and the Arab states could form a coalition against Iran. Well, the Arab nations don't want a coalition against Iran. They have their differences with Iran, but they're actually trying to patch those up. And they're all working with Russia and China. So that was, that failed. They wanted to get Saudi Arabia to produce more oil. That failed. Saudi Arabia instead is making deals with Russia. Uh, to trade in their own currencies and to actually buy Russian oil, which they then sell to the West to avoid the, <laughs> the sanctions against buying Russian oil, uh, and working with China. Iran is working with China. It's working with Russia. Iran is appealing to be a member of the, of the BRICS, along with Argentina and, uh, and uh, Indonesia. So the world is coming together around collaboration with the Belt and Road, with Russia and China and India, who have begun to really work much more closely with Russia and China. Uh, and, you know, the, the people backing what Tony Blinken says, the isolation of Russia, well, the isolation of Russia is from the U.S. and Europe, the EU, the five eyes, Argentina, I mean, not Argentina, I mean uh, Australia and New Zealand, and and Japan and South Korea, which you have to recognize are still really militarily occupied countries, uh, and Singapore, which is a banking outpost for the British. But the rest of the world, all of us South America, all of Africa, and most of Asia, have nothing to do with these crazy sanctions against Russia, which they know are responsible for the, the extreme threat of global famine. They don't believe for a minute this is Russia. This is the sanctions that have caused this. And if you wonder why it was that the EU blinked last week, blinked in a very serious way, where Turkey was able to negotiate a deal between Ukraine and Russia, the two countries that, of course, won't talk to each other, according to Zelensky, but organized a deal to begin the export of the grain from Ukraine. Why? It's because the rest of the world was screaming that it's the sanctions that were preventing that export. And what's not as much reported in the media is that part of that deal was that Russia demanded that the secondary sanctions against them, you hear Tony Blinken and, and so forth say all over and over again, it's Russia causing this global famine because of the their, their refusal to export their wheat and fertilizer and so forth. Well, that's just not true. There were no sanctions on their wheat and their fertilizer, but there were sanctions on the insurance of the ships that would transport it and, and sanctions on the ships using the port. So Russia demanded that those be lifted, and they agreed, the EU agreed. So this was a, a, a crack in the door, a, a, a slight move towards recognizing that these sanctions are the, are the problem. And as you know, Helga Zeplerouche's call for stopping these sanctions against Russia and, in fact, against the whole world, these illegal, uh, uh, absolutely uh, genocidal sanctions 
that destroy the people of the countries you're sanctioning, not just the government. In fact, not, not the government as much as the people, that these have to be stopped. And then sure enough, within less than a week, there's a, a, a chink in the army, a little bit of a, of a giving in that these sanctions have to be released in order to get the food and the fertilizer, and in fact, it included uh, Russian oil and gas, too. So this is all sort of in motion. So Biden's trip was a total, total failure. Uh, the other thing he kept saying throughout the visit was, I'm not going to allow a void in the Middle East to allow Russia and China to move in here. Well, sorry, Joe, Russia and China are there. The Belt and, Ride, uh, Belt and Road is very active in Saudi Arabia as well as Iran, even in Israel, for the, as a matter of fact. Uh, and Russia, uh, well, I'll tell you about Russia, because in contrast to Biden's trip, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the foreign minister from Russia, just completed a, a, a tour of Afri- Africa, which was just, it, just absolutely astonishing, extraordinary. And remember, Putin has often said, we're going to electrify Africa with nuclear power. So here's Lavrov. He went to four countries. He went to Egypt. He went to the Republic of Congo, to uh, uh, Uganda, and to Ethiopia. Okay. Well, first, he went to Egypt. He met with LCC. Uh, They discussed oil and gas deals, despite all the accusations and the threatened sanctions against anybody who does deals with Russia. They made deals for oil and gas, but most importantly, they celebrated the fact that last month, the Russian Rosatom, their state nuclear agency, began the construction of four large uh, uh, nuclear power plants on the Mediterranean, 1.2 gigawatt nuclear power plants, altogether 4.8 gigawatt, well, eventually, when they get all four of these done, a huge nuclear project in Egypt, right? I mean, compare that to Biden going over there with his geopolitical demands about, you know, you must be with us or against us. Lavrov's not telling anybody you have to be with us or against us. You can go ahead and work with the U.S. They're not offering anything. But, you know, maintain relations. But, you know, we'll work with you to develop this tremendous potential. And, of course, the Belt and Road from China is doing the same thing. So not only that, but Egypt happens to be the headquarters for the Arab League. So 22 Arab countries have permanent representatives in Cairo. Lavrov went and met with all 22 of these permanent representatives. He went through a detailed des- description of what's happening with this Ukraine crisis, how it came about and why it's there, what has to be done to resolve it. All right? Then... He went on, I won't go through the, the Republic of Congo and Uganda. Actually, in Uganda, uh, President Museveni gave a, <laughs> a press conference where he said, we love Russia. We love Russia building our economy. We love Russia who's protecting us, our security. We love Russia who's helping us fight terror. <laughs> we love Russia. And then he went to Ethiopia. Now, what, and he met with the Ethiopian leaders. There's, uh, this, this is, uh, Ethiopia has been sort of the, the core port for China's Belt and Road development and the rest of Africa is sort of a hub for that process. But it's also the headquarters for the Africa Union. Uh, the, and, and therefore, they are permanent representatives from every Afri- African country in Addis Ababa. And Lavrov went and met with them. And again, he went through what's going on with this war in Ukraine. What's this about? Now, what's the real crisis facing? humanity in terms of the total breakdown of the Western dollar-based system and forcing the rest of the world to come to terms with how to trade outside of the dollar with local currencies and potentially put together a new global financial system to pull out from under this British-controlled dollar system uh, and create a system which, in fact, can eventually be joined by the Western country. I won't go through that here, but this is uh, what's going on. So this is uh, a stark contrast about what is being, how the world is viewing uh, this insane push for war with Russia and China uh, and the, uh, the who is responsible for the greatest economic breakdown crisis in modern history, perhaps in all of history, depending on how this goes. 
So uh, that's that's where we are. Um, and Dennis pointed something out to me when we were discussing what to do tonight, which I think is, is very interesting. If you look at Russia and you look at Africa, Russia is by and by by much the greatest, the largest uh, physical country in the world. It has a total of about uh, 6.5 million square square uh, million square uh, square square miles. There you go, million square miles. 6.5. That's more than half of the total area of Africa, which is about 11.7 square miles. So you put these two together, and you recognize that these are the least exploited areas of the entire world. In a sense, they're the last uh, new frontiers that are left on the Earth. There's many new frontiers on the moon and on Mars and beyond. Right? But on Earth, these are the areas that, that require and have the potential for huge development potential. And for Russia and China, especially in collabor- uh, Russia and Africa in collaboration with the Chinese, to look at the real huge potential for Africa to become, in a sense, another China, another area which goes from extreme poverty, starvation, famine, death, disease, pandemic, to becoming one of the most productive and powerful and, and uh, scientifically driven parts of the world. It's exactly within our grasp. This is, this is what's potential and this is what's being pursued. Now, our job is that we have to get Americans and Europeans to recognize that and that either we change the way these leaders think uh, or we do what's required to change leaders, uh, but the absolute urgency is that we take this moment in which millions and millions and millions of people are waking up to the disaster and waking up to the fact that they have, uh, they have neglected their responsibility as human beings to the rest of the human race. But now that it's hitting them, now that the hyperinflation is hitting everybody, that the fear of nuclear war is something you cannot escape, people are beginning to uh, look back to see who's been telling the truth, and they're looking around to see who's providing solutions. And this, of course, is, is what the LaRouche movement is all about. So I'll leave that. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Let me get to the questions and answer mode here. Let's see. Okay, so I've opened up the queue. Please press star six to get into the queue. As I said, I would indicate at least the draft text of certain uh, of the responses that have already come to the Ukraine statement, and we'll come to some other things. But here's something that has been uh, drafted. We, the participants in various conferences of the Schiller Institute, are accused of promoting, quote, Russian propaganda on a list posted by the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation, which is officially part of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, operating under the authority of the president. In times of war, publishing such a list is tantamount to targeting individuals. It is all the more unacceptable that the list agglomerates the names of many speakers representing top institutions from around the globe with diverse opinions who are involved in a dialogue searching to arrive at peace in the interest of all. To assume that such a wide array of speakers are all, quote, Putin agents and can't think for themselves can only be explained by a belief in conspiracy theories or as mere vulgar propaganda or both. The key question is whether the listed speakers are promoting viewpoints consonant with the truth. Normally, this would be up to an audience to decide, but the U.S. slash NATO efforts to blacklist those that would offer any, quote, alternative narrative, unquote, on Ukraine, until now remains unchallenged. So hats off to Ukraine for providing a handy list of speakers who voice different ideas. Those interested in finding out the truth will now be better able to compare the official story, the narrative, with an uncompromised critique 
determine which can bear close which can bear close scrutiny and decide for themselves which analysis is closer to the truth okay so that's now being circulated uh, and there are various answers that uh, were given by various individuals I may say something about that a little bit later but there are various people in the queue and I will sort of perhaps alternate some of the material of what we have uh, uh, we have now that we're putting out uh, with the uh, questions and answers. So let me go first to the, uh, to the line here. Okay, are you able to hear us? Hi, this is Chris from Panama. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Mike. Dennis, Diane Sear print, um, posted an, an excerpt from that list. Where can we get a full list? Because I think it would be a great thing to be able to distribute to friends and families you mean a full list of all of the people that were included in the uh, by Ukraine in the attack? Yep, my wife is just telling me Helga posted it, that she has it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. 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 You can. You, that's what I was about to say. So you can get it there. Uh, yeah. And so people know one of the things that we are also doing, or partially by at request, is there are some speakers that have been uh, on our conference, like Kirk Weeby, for example who are not included in the Ukraine list and they want to get onto the Ukraine list, at least get onto our, they're going to get that is they're going to get, they're going to sign the text of whatever statement that all of our, all of our speakers put out as a whole. See, Helga put out her own statement. Um, uh, Other other people, Sam Petroda put out his own statement uh, and uh, various other people like Scott Ritter, who's also on the, on the list, put out the statement. Uh, so we're going that those will be out there as individual statements, but then we want to have a, a statement which is in effect from all those that participated already or wish to join those that participated. So I right. just wanted to say that, and yeah, and so it's a good idea. What you're saying is a very good idea. Let me simply point out to people that uh, since Jimmy Dore, for example, was lamenting the fact that he was not on the list. Uh, one way that you can, you know, change that is to interview various of the people that were on the list, not just the people that you feel safe with, but the people that were listed from the beginning, like Helga Sepp LaRouche. As was pointed out already, I think some people might, right, not have heard it. Nobody has mentioned Helga, I believe, up until at this moment. Is that right, Mike? I, as far as I know, yeah, nobody. Or the Schiller Institute, even though it's, you know, anybody with a tiny, tiny bit of investigation would recognize that the first 30 names on that list were people that spoke at the Schiller Institute conferences. Yeah. It would also be great to have a list of all the people who would like to be on the list. <laughs> <laughs> it is a badge of honor. There's, there's no question. This, you know, this was a terrible, terrible blunder. <laughs> by MI6 and CIA, who obviously set up this, this uh, Center for Countering Disinformation. Remember that the Department of Homeland Security here just a few months ago set up their own uh, Department of Disinformation to do exactly the same thing, to refute anybody telling the truth about the wars and about Russia and about China, to, to declare them to be uh, uh, disinformation. You know, the truth is disinformation. This is a, a censorship level unprecedented in modern history um and yet uh as you know they appointed this dingbat woman i forget her name now uh to be the head of it and it was so extreme such a lunatic that they had to fire her but they didn't they didn't shut down this department they appointed somebody else to run it and obviously uh, the department of homeland security disinformation agency would obviously be in close collaboration with that one in kiev uh, as as is the Integrity Initiative and the other similar disinformation operations in the United Kingdom. So this is a CIA MI6 operation. This is not just some weirdos in Ukraine uh, who are aware that their entire so-called, quote, narrative is in grave danger because of the Schiller Institute, because literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people around the world are now responding to the Schiller Institute, to our conferences, to Harley Schlanger's blog. Uh, they're writing in. They're getting in contact. They recognize that the Schiller Institute conferences 
uniquely in the world are pulling together leaders, political leaders, scientific leaders, uh, economists, artists from every part of the world to have a platform where they can come together and dialogue with each other and tell the truth uh, and formulate ideas about how we can break through this massive, massive brainwashing and, and information warfare and give people who are now desperate for solutions. They know the danger. The vast majority of people now know the danger of nuclear war, of hyperinflationary collapse. They're looking for solutions, and this is where we have an awesome responsibility. LaRouche once said, I've, I've said this many times, but when I first met him in 1971 when, when Nixon pulled the dollar off of gold, he said this was the beginning of the end of the American system. The British system was going to take over. Uh, unregulated banks speculating, turning the economy away from production and into speculation maintaining only the banks and the military while the real economy and the, and the welfare of the population is, is neglected. Uh, and he said, nobody's going to want to hear that, that we're warning of this. They don't want to believe it. They don't want to have to do anything about it. Uh, they don't want to implement the solutions that he was proposing. But he said, when this happens, everybody will look back and, 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 and ask who's been telling us the truth all these years and who's been lying. And that, that's the moment we're in. So this is what this release represents, is that they're terrified that the world is listening to the wise words of Lyndon LaRouche. And therefore, they foolishly thought that by declaring us and anybody associated with us to be Russian disinformation agents, somehow that was going to stop uh, this this was a terrible blunder on his part, and we must take full advantage to both blow this effort to start a war. We can stop this war. And even more than that, blow the 50 years of containment of the ideas of Lyndon LaRouche. This can be broken now. Uh, this is an opportunity which we must take full advantage of to give citizens of every nation on earth a sense that they've been deprived of the wisdom, the insight, the brilliance of Lyndon LaRouche over these last 50 years, uh, and that now is a moment we can blow that apart. This happens to be the, it uh, would have been the 100th birthday of Lyndon LaRouche on September 8th, and we're going to have a series of major, major uh, events around that, and on the following weekend, September 10th and 11th, which is also 9-11th anniversary, uh, in, in not only in honor of Lyndon LaRouche, uh, but also to make abundantly clear that now more than ever, the fact that his policies, his proposals for how we can and must uh, restore sanity and, and revive uh, the American system, revive a policy of development even beyond the original ideas of, of Roosevelt and the Bretton Woods, that we can, in fact, create a renaissance, which is not a renaissance of one part of the world, but of human race as a whole. This is the moment of opportunity, uh, despite the extreme danger, in a sense because of the extreme danger, that we can achieve something truly great, which changes the, changes the direction of humanity as a whole in a positive direction. Yeah, let me point out, uh, for example, Scott Ritter, People uh, know who he is. We'll say something about him in this. His, his, here is part of his response. I'm not reading it as it exactly appears. I'm, I'm, I'm reading some paragraphs. I'm going to the center of it. He says this. He writes, first of all, to Senator Chuck Schumer and also to Christian Gillibrand uh, as, a, as a constituent, demanding that they take action uh, around what's called public law 117-128, uh, which directed that, quote, funds made available by this title under the heading Economic Support Fund may be made available for direct financial support for the government of Ukraine. So here's the thing that he points out. He says, on July 12, 2022, the United States Agency for International Development issued a press release in which it announced that $1.7 billion in direct budgetary aid was provided to Ukraine under Public Law 117-128, which allowed the government of Ukraine, among other things, 
to pay the salaries of Ukrainian civil servants. This would logically include the salaries of the employees of the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation. It says, uh, while, this, while the specific criterion used by the Ukrainian Center for Countering Disinformation for selecting persons for inclusion on this blacklist is not known, in my case, the Ukrainian government appears to have taken umbrage against my articulation of Ukraine as a NATO base of operations, my analysis of the Bucha massacre in early March, which assigns responsibility to Ukrainian security services, and my description of the current Ukraine-Russian conflict as a proxy conflict being waged on behalf of the United States. Uh, And so what he is uh, uh, saying is, as a constituent whose name has appeared on the so-called blacklist, published by Ukrainian Center. So that my personal and professional life has been and continues to be detrimentally impacted by the chilling effect of being labeled a, quote, Russian propagandist for simply exercising the right to free speech guaranteed by the United States Constitution. Uh, Moreover, Ukraine has a history of converting blacklists of this nature into kill lists where those who speak out against the policies of the Ukrainian government are being murdered or threatened with violence. I'm certain you agree with me that Congress cannot be in a position where, through its actions, foreign governments are provided the means to intimidate citizens of the United States from exercising their constitutionally protected rights regarding free speech. So I cite that because, uh, as you might uh, hear there, there are some implications as to what these people have done. Uh, some, and some important decisions or conclusions for, conclusions for us to draw. Uh, and we have to do this very quickly. So for everybody that's listening, just put it like, I'll put it like this. If we had the money, we would have an ad in the New York Times or Washington Post tomorrow with the people who will sign that statement or something like what I just read to you uh, from this list. And obviously, that would get picked up for all over the world. Just as the list got picked up, we could, of course, and of course, we're going to try to do this anyway. We're going to go back to the people and say, well, you know, this is what they published. Uh, so we need you to put this up on your blog, on your Twitter feed, um, on your, you know, uh, podcast. Okay. And, and give this uh, the prominence that, the, that, that, that it deserves because we've got to defend the people on the list as well as defend the rights to free speech, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, just wanted to indicate that otherwise, uh, and people should think therefore about uh, the resources we clearly do need. There's a lot of different ways in which people can help. There's financial help, there's contacts and doing networking of your own. Um, there's a lot, of a-, a lot of activity that people are more than welcome to participate in.